So, I think it's time that we should get started here. Be punctual, everybody's on time. So, we're going to go ahead and get started. So, I am broadcasting to you from frigid southeast Michigan. Uh, I know everybody's coming from a lot of different parts of the country, so I hope it's nicer where you're at. But, uh, you know, any day we're playing with SolidWorks is a good day. So, welcome. I, uh, I'm glad everybody's here today. So, we are going to get into um, tips and tricks on drawings. Uh, my name is Darren. I have been here for a long time um, and really have gotten to grow with this software. It's part of me. It's, it's really uh, been part of who I am, and I'm trying to pass that down to my girls as well. Um, really, I was just fortunate enough to find a job doing what I love, so um, hopefully everybody else out there is as fortunate as I am there. Some of the things that I like to do with the software when I'm not working is really utilize um, you know, anything I can to solve a problem. So a lot of times I'll use my 3D printer to print a part, to, to solve some sort of a need or to repurpose some parts. I like to tinker around the yard and do a lot of DIY. So those are some pretty important things as well. Um, lately, I've been getting into more things, trying to involve my girls once again, and our treehouse comes up quite a bit. So that's a fun project there. But everything we do is vetted in SolidWorks. And my current work in progress is now a complete first floor remodel, which of course had to be done in SolidWorks first. Otherwise, we really didn't know how we wanted to lay out the cabinets. One of the things that all of these things have in common is though we have these beautiful 3D tools, everything still seems to originate from a drawing. Anything tangible, anything where we actually start cutting chips and going to production. So no matter what I'm doing, I'm still going to lay it out in a 2D drawing because not just as tradition, but it's the thing that, that really allows us to depict those different views. So it's a necessary thing and we're trying to go paperless and there's a lot of technologies for the ambitious to try those things. But really for about 80% of the people out there, the 2D drawing is still the old standby. It gets the job done and it's worked for decades. So we're going to cover a lot of different things. These are a random smattering of things, so there's really not the best flow to tips and tricks. But it's a lot of things that I find interesting in the software, and I hope you will too. Um, some of the things are, are hidden settings. Some of the things are really just more behavior, how you treat things or how you create. But really, I want to open your eyes up to maybe a lot of the things that you aren't aware of. Because 25 years into the software, there's been a lot of additions to it. Unless you're really, really, really reading those manuals closely, you're going to miss some of those things. So never miss a chance to watch somebody show SolidWorks. So we're going to begin with bills and materials. Now, the bill of materials has some interesting behavior, and, and there's some subtleties to it that, that really can go unnoticed. Um, so I want to show you a little bit about uh, what it can tell you about what is ballooned. Now, there's another functionality that's a real great deliverable. Not everybody in the company has uh, SolidWorks available to them usually. So we like to save off things like bills and materials here as Excel spreadsheets. And there's some great functionality here to really demystify that for the downstream user. Now, when working with bills and materials, there's plenty of ways to tweak it and make it exactly what you like. So we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. And then, um, you know, the Alt key. That really works in a lot of different places. It's a whole presentation on its own. And uh, the Alt key itself is, uh, you know, something that can then move features around pretty easily. So let's just move over to SolidWorks here for a second. Get right into it. So when we're looking at the bill of materials, first of all, um, these bill of materials have these little borders next to them. And when you hover over those, you can see those. Now, typically, the border is very close. You're going to see the bill of materials. Typically, you'll hover over it, and this is the look you'll get. And typically, users will try to grab this upper corner and move things around. Um, truth be told, you can use your Alt key next to your keyboard, and you can grab that bill of materials anywhere. So if it's a little bit tedious to grab that corner, just use the Alt key, and that'll take care of moving these kind of things. Any tables um, will work that way. If you hit the triple arrows, pops out a little list of what these components are and you really get a nifty um, thumbnail over top of those when you actually hover but what you also see here is an indication of what parts actually have balloons and which ones don't it's really subtle once again but it does let you know very simply what those are now there's some interesting behavior with the bill of materials where it has some bi-directional um, feedback to it so if you were to go ahead and say click on one of these components what it'll do is actually on screen it highlights them i'm going to try and zoom back a little bit and let you see that subtlety again if i go ahead and pick a line item right here what it actually does is highlights those components so you can actually see those highlighting right up here um, so there's great feedback for being able to identify a component maybe from the bill of materials that you might want to work with and then being able to see that out on screen here um, one that kind of got me earlier was this one here. Pick that part. It actually will bi-directionally feed back here, and it indicates that that one has a balloon if you take a real close look to it. But the funny thing about that is there's a quantity of two, and the other quantity is right over here. So if you select it at the bill of materials, you'll actually see both of them highlight out on screen. So those are some great little details there. Now, these thumbnails are actually accessible to people um, not using SolidWorks. When you right-click any table, say save as typically this is a way to take a customized table table and save it as a template but if you simply save that as an excel format uh, old or new format will do 
I'm just going to call this the webinar, so we'll just call it web. But we have a nifty button here called thumbnails. And what that'll do is it will save this Excel spreadsheet exactly the way that our build materials looks, but it will also include each of those thumbnails there. Okay, so the drag and drop reorder is another thing that I really want to show you. And then I want to talk about configurations. There's two things here. One of the things I want to talk about with configurations actually is there's a little bit of an issue with it. I want to show you exactly what the configuration problem happens to be. Um, typically when you're dealing with build materials, you want to balloon consistent around the drawing. We'll talk about balloons on the next slide here as well. Um, but for this particular one, what I want to do is go ahead and do some, um, some reordering as well. So let's get a couple of files up here on screen. When we go ahead and pull up this particular feature here, I want to grab one of the recent documents that I've got here. So let's just go ahead and say, I will grab this one here. Whenever you're looking at balloons on screen, the balloons themselves are driven by a bill of materials. And what happens is, is if you have multiple views, um, maybe views that are a different configuration or a different body as we're seeing here, what you're going to get are some details that are, um, are, are going to maybe be a mismatch here. And I want to talk about that. So two things. First of all, when you hover over that bill of materials and you roll that out, what you're going to notice here is that each one of these has a particular item number to those. Now, the item numbers here happen to be built from the view in the upper right hand corner. If we go ahead and actually balloon the view that we have over here on the right, or left, excuse me, you're going to see that that number really doesn't match anything over here. In fact, these are all individual numbers. If we go ahead and balloon this body right down here, you'll also see that that's showing up as a number one. Now what would happen is if we were to balloon or build materials these individual views, we would have a completely unique list of what those balloons would be based on the build materials per view. But if you right click in a view and go down to properties, what you're going to see is the ability to link that build materials to the one that's already been generated. So once we go ahead and link that, what you'll go ahead and see is the change to now the individual numerical that's there. So now we're seeing it actually matches up with the plate that it indicates. Now same thing down here, right click inside the view and go to properties. We'll go ahead and grab that link. And once we say okay to that, you'll see that that will pull up the unique description that we have in there. Now the issue that we've been having with this, uh, at least in this service pack, and I'm not worried about telling you this because it's an important feature and I don't want uh, you to miss out on it, is that if you have multiple configurations on a view, we're having trouble in service pack two here of actually setting that up. So um, when we get back to that, uh, service pack three should have that one fixed, but you can have multiple configurations of an assembly and have all the balloons sequenced perfectly but pointing to one single bill of materials. So that's the thing that we wanted to, uh, to get to on that one. All right, let's move on. So ballooning specifically, there's some really neat functions when it comes to ballooning. Uh, I did put the years that some of these were put in there. Some of them I don't know the years. Uh, they've been in there as longer, longer than I can remember. But essentially when we're taking a look at these features, a lot of people will say, wow, when was that put in there? So I kind of like to know that because you really lose track of that at some point and you don't know what you don't know in most cases. So with this one here, what I want to do is show you a little bit about auto balloon, how you can create and edit those. It's actually quite an interesting process. And then some quantity tags, again, something people are rarely aware, oh, aware of. Um, and then one of my favorite little features here, the spline leader, all those are pretty simple to do. So we're going to work in a backwards order here. Let's go to the spline leader first. If you simply select any of your balloons, so we can window around those. If you want to grab those, you can uh, cross select or you can control select those, whatever happens to be. When you grab your balloons, you come over here to the property manager and hit more options. What will happen is a little tool here called the spline balloon. Now these balloons are going to create essentially a leader that looks like a, uh, a style spline. And when you select on each of these, you have some individual controls over how that gets manipulated. So these are great for patent drawings, um, you know, unique areas where you have to get to a part that's maybe a little bit difficult to point to and you have to cross or weave through a bunch of different areas. Um, little right clicks on here do have some opportunities to go ahead and uh, you know change the stack and, and add some things to that. But essentially what you're going to get here is an opportunity to just grab that feature, drag it around and make it look nice. Now if any one of these has a multiple quantity, it's actually over in the property manager as well. It's a little quantity check mark there and if the component has multiples, it's simply going to indicate that right there next to the balloon. So again, it's a really powerful thing, really simple to do and it's going to be associative. So whatever matches up with our bill of materials over here, it's going to be exactly what shows on the associative balloon. Lives with it, moves around with it. Okay, let's hit some auto ballooning. Auto ballooning, shockingly enough, has been around since SolidWorks 2004 area. Um, so that's really what we're looking at when it comes to how long some of these features have been around. Now they've been enhanced over the years, of course, but they originated, um, you know, a decade and a half ago for this particular feature. I want to show you the workflow of this because auto ballooning is powerful if you know how to play with it. So what I have here is a simple view, it's an assembly. 
Now, if you go ahead with just normal ballooning, which again is easy in its own right, you're just touching parts and placing balloons. Um, it's very error proof, uh, very simple to do, um, but more trouble than it's worth when it comes to even how easy this is. What you can do instead, is you can actually pick the view and hit auto balloon. Now I'm doing this after the fact, so I want you to see that there's a mix of balloons being used here. So some manual, when you hit auto balloon, it will then balloon the rest of the parts that are actually visible, um, simply based on, again, visibility. So there is a point where you might not get a balloon on a part because it happens to be interior or hidden. Now when we're putting these in place, what we're going to get here is some sequencing that matches up with these numbers. So it didn't re-balloon the ones that were already ballooned, it just simply put those in place. Now with that, I have an opportunity, if I'd like to, to take my balloons and add them to the magnetic lines. Uh, but again, they're balloons that were added in uh, uh, multiple functionalities. Now if you pick that view and hit auto balloon again, what you're going to see here is regular settings for auto balloon. Um, what you might not know is that if there's a bill of materials attached to this, there's much more capabilities here. So we ballooned a view that didn't have a bill of materials, which doesn't make sense anyway. But if I go ahead and simply add a bill of materials to this view, and we're just going to use the standard default BOM that we get, what that will then enable, if I now pick the view and hit auto balloon again, is it gives us some editability to this. Now what it will do is a couple of things. It will allow us to resequence the existing balloons, including the ones that we put in manually prior to auto ballooning, by simply changing the order. You can see that their sequence works starting in a clockwise type of a motion. Or if we say follow assembly sequence, then that's where we're going to go ahead and get um, the different numbers to show in that order. Now you could also simply go ahead and say replace balloons, which will then re-balloon the entire thing for you regardless of how you started it or how you wanted to finish it. This will take care of all parts that are visible and again deal with the bill materials that we have listed here. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. Now the drag and drop reorder is also a very simple thing. If I go ahead and take a look at say line item number one here, and we expand out the bill materials, you'll notice that I can actually grab that row. So we'll grab row number two and we'll drag it down, put it somewhere else. Let's actually expand that out to do that, sorry. That's what we want to do. Um, so we're going to grab these. Oh, I think I can't do it because of my auto ballooning order. My, my. Well, we get into these kind of things as well. Um, in any event, I'll show you one that's actually manually ordered because this one is controlled by auto ballooning. Now, one thing that I want to show you other than that is if we go into auto balloon one more time here, you can go ahead and do the same kind of things when it comes to the editing, replacing the balloons and changing those. But you can also change the number that it starts at and if it jumps by ones or twos or fives. But the other thing is, um, you know, being able to just replace those balloons once again and start over again and really control exactly where things are going to start. Um, order sequentially is a nice way to do that once again, uh, and it will start at whatever one you want to choose. So even though we have one through 11 in this order, if you say, I want to start right here or right here, for example, it will actually start at the one you click and then it will go ahead and sequence around from there. So those are the couple things that I wanted to show you there. Auto balloons are going to control this a little bit more and, and inhibit some of the editability over here of this uh, bill of materials. But we'll come back to that one and show you at a later uh, example. Okay, so let's just get into some basic dimensions and detailing. A lot of little things on this one. This is a symbol that I'm sure everybody has seen. You may or may not have even turned it off. Um, I know a lot of people ignore it and I want to show you what it can do. So we're going to play a little bit with rapid dimension. The dimension palette, also one of my favorite little hidden tools. There's some great tools on it, but the ones that I rely on religiously are things like auto align. I want you to see what that looks like as well. And then a tool called the format painter. This thing here is actually in Microsoft applications. Um, it's a very similar thing that you might do in Excel or Word. So it's a great way to maximize what you're working on and uh, not have to reinvent the wheel when it comes to, uh, to manipulating or tweaking uh, dimensional values. So let's go back over to SOLIDWORKS for a couple of different views here. First thing I want to do is, uh, let's get another document open here for a second. Uh, what I want to do on this one is just use a little auto ballooning. Now, you may or may not take your dimensions directly from um, the part files or the assembly files. You may just create a part that's parametric and changes properly, but when you get to the drawing, you go ahead and redimension the entire thing. None of those are going to prohibit you from doing some of the things I'm about to show you. Now, for the sake of time here, what I'm going to do is simply insert model items and just bring those in from the part file. One thing I implore if you do this method here is um, when you're going to bring in the dimensions and other annotations directly from the model, turn this check mark off here, this use dimension placement and sketch. That thing is actually going to put the dimensions exactly where you put them when you sketched or when you made the feature. And if you're not really controlled or clear with those, that's just going to carry over to being ugly here. With that actually turned off, what you'll end up with is a really clean layout and it will nest all the dimensions short inside large. Now there's a feature here that we've had in a long time in SOLIDWORKS where if a dimension gets placed into a view you don't want it, you can actually just pick and drag it using the shift key. 
Now, if I try to drag it into a view and let go, what it will do is just simply auto locate. Now, if I try to drag it into a view, it doesn't make sense. It simply won't work. So there's a dimension there. We'll go ahead and deal with that guy a little bit later. So I want to show you a little bit about rapid dimension. Rapid dimension is a tool where if you go ahead and simply start placing dimensions, it's going to allow you to put those dimensions on one side or the other, simply um, nesting or pushing other dimensions out of the way. So if I grab an edge here and I want to go to the left or to the right, just by hovering over each of those widgets, it's actually pushing that out in order to give me the proper position um, for it to be nested. Now, in this particular case, if I also go ahead and grab an additional edge and maybe go vertical with this, we get the same kind of look there. I can go up or down, and it will simply shove those dimensions out of the way in order to fit that in there nicely. So it's a very cool tool. It's clean for what it does. The settings for this are actually under Tools and Options. So if you go under Tools and Options and get into the Document Properties, there's some arrow functionality that you're going to get into this. And it has to do a lot with the dimensions and details and things that you get with your annotations. But the main thing is, is if you're looking for something in here, and I just want to show you this as a way to, to, again, speed things up. If you're looking for things like arrow settings, you can just simply type things in. And if you type it properly, then it's going to go ahead and give you the wild cards for whatever those types of things happen to be. So when you click on things like arrow placement or arrows follow text or some of these other ones where it's actually the standards or the size, what that's going to do is give you opportunity to go ahead and set what those arrows are going to look like for the detailing that you get. Now when we're looking at the different details that we have out here in the different views, some of the settings will actually allow you to change the arrow sizes, but they'll also allow you to actually fit those dimensions off of the part itself. So right here, this offset distance is how far off of the part it's going to go. And then this six millimeters here is how far each subsequent dimension is going to shift from each other. So those values right there are actually what's controlling how these little nests are happening when it's shifting to the left or to the right. Now, when you have something that's round, let's go ahead and just grab a radius here. I know this is a, a little redundant based on the geometry. Not too bad right there. What I can do is grab these widgets in these corners. And again, it's going to shift it and shove it over into a corner that kind of makes sense. So it really helps with the placement of any one of these items. Now, I want to talk a little bit also about um, the actual dimension palette tool. When you're putting dimensions in and when you're moving these things around, there's a lot of fine tuning that can take place. And one of my favorite tools to use for this is a little tool here that uh, does auto alignment. So if I have all of these dimensions selected, this little pop up that shows up is your dimension palette. You can grab this corner, you can drag it off to the side. With the dimension palette selected, you can simply hit auto arrange. And what it will do is simply put those dimensions in a nice position. You can also space them a little bit further, um, equal spacing once again, but it's a really easy way to go ahead and deal with those. If you happen to be up here and you want to change something, for example, I want to change this dimension's properties. The dimension palette's great for that too because you can quickly get to things like your tolerances. So if I want to put a basic tolerance on this one or I want to put a bilateral, so we got a plus and a minus, won't go too far on that one, but that's going to give me a nice bilateral there. Now, if I wanted to put that tolerance on multiple locations, here's the trick. If you want to do this and you want to put it in in multiple places and not have to do this, this individual detail, that's where the format painter comes in. You grab the format painter and you pick a source document or a source property, in this case, a dimension. And then the next ones you click will simply apply that particular formatting to it. So it's a copy of the settings and paste them onto others, essentially. So it's a really quick way to go ahead and deal with this. Now then, of course, once I have my dimensions all misstacked as a result of this, what I can do is select all of those. And then using the dimension palette, we can just simply go ahead and auto arrange. And it will, again, shove those into a position that's going to work pretty nicely for the view that we've got here. So again, fine tuning necessary. Maybe we'll just move that view out of the way. So that works really well. So that's a lot about what those auto alignment tools do. You can really do some damage and add some dimensions and make a really, really, really big mess. And at the end of the day, simply select all those dimensions, hit your palette and hit auto align and everything goes back to good. So for my money, that's a really quick way to do it. And that's a mix of imported dimensions from the model as well as manual reference dimensions. So there's a lot going on with that. Pretty great stuff though. Okay, so dimensional detail. Um, if you came from an AutoCAD background or even board drafting, these are the kind of things that you're really into. Um, making it look production level, but also dealing with these details for clarity, which are necessary. So breaking a dimension is an important feature here. I want to cover that quickly. And then there's a little angle selection reference. Um, a lot of people still do this to this day by drawing in some sketch geometry. So I want to talk about both of those features. So let's just go ahead and pop back over to SolidWorks for a sec. Okay, so what we're going to do on this one is, let me jump back over to this view. Um, looking at this drawing, first of all, I want to show you this angle selector. It's pretty wild. When you don't have an edge to be able to put a proper dimension in, you don't need it, actually. 
What I mean is, is if I grab my Smart Dimension tool, let's say I want to put an angle dimension right here in this area. By grabbing the edge, what it will do is typically give me the linear value, and in this case, it's the true length of that line. But as I start to move away from that, I'm trying to put it in either vertical, vertical or horizontal. Well, instead of having a vertical edge here to reference to click, what you can do is simply click the end line. And by clicking the point right at the end of it, you're going to get this reference selector that allows you to pick an edge as a reference. And by picking the vertical edge, it will automatically locate that feature based on the acute or the obtuse or the included angle, but based on that vertical edge being understood. Now, once that's in place, of course, it's locked there. You can move it outside if you wanted to. There's also some nifty little switches where you can go ahead and flip the direction of that and you know go to some different orientations and other things. So it's really a, an easy way to do things, but you don't have to have that little extra bit of detail in order to go ahead and put in a dimension such as this. Breaking dimensions is one of the ones that I see a lot of people having trouble with. Um, if you take a look at this dimension, for example, I'm going to take it and actually drag it across all of these dimensions. And where we're crossing all of these dimensions, they're actually showing. One of the things I've noticed is that a lot of people will pick this dimension as the break dimension, and you can go ahead and do that if you want to. Um, by going ahead and selecting that, what it's going to do is break that dimension, which you can see now that there's a given gap between where that dimension overlaps all of the other lines. And if you move it, of course, that line's going to break and it's going to change. So wherever you drag that, you can see it's changing quite uh, dynamically. Now, most of the time, a user is going to do that the opposite way. We're not going to use this line to be the break line. In fact, we're going to go ahead and take this one and put it back where it was, but we're going to grab these two linear dimensions, and let's go ahead and put those as the break. And once you set those up again, you're going to see that now those witness or extension lines are going to be the ones that actually break as this dimension moves around. But it's a way for you to still gain clarity when you really just can't get those dimensions to sit in their own clear area. Obviously, we set this one up for that, but that's the way that little feature works. Okay, next thing I want to hit is um, something that was on that previous slide, and it's called Baseline and Chain Dimensions. And it's going to take a different file here to, uh, to get opened up. So let me go ahead and grab just another document real fast here. The chain and baseline dimensions are a different type of dimension, much like an ordinate. 90% uh, of the time, I think most of you rely on smart dimensions. They're very smart, but there are some dimensions that do require some behavior. Now, up here in the corner, we have some dimensions that are known as baseline dimensions, and I'll show you how this gets created. But what you'll mainly see here is if I grab one dimension, they all move as a group. And much like an ordinate dimension, if you right-click on it and actually go down to this setting here, you can add to the baseline, which means anything else that I grab. So I go ahead and grab maybe you know that edge. Um, we'll grab that edge. It's going to go ahead and start jumping these dimensions in place. And again, shoving the other dimensions out of the way in order to accommodate for those. Those happen to be the same, so that's a little redundant. Now, as a result of all of this, um, what we have is, again, a full group of dimensions. And if we needed to, we could you know, grab one of those dimensions um, using the uh, dimension palette here. Again, really simply, auto-spacing these. So grab this little thumb wheel, move them in and out. So it's really easy to deal with those. Now, dimensions have been added also in a different form called a chain dimension. Um, that was added in SOLIDWORKS 2020, actually. If you right-click on these baseline dimensions, you can actually convert this to a chain dimension, and it will look completely different. What a chain dimension typically is for is if you right-click, let's go ahead and just get into some dimension tools here. So if we go ahead and go to more dimensions and we actually grab the chain dimension, what we're basically doing is picking a baseline, like an ordinate. But as soon as I go ahead and start picking edges, what it will do is simply click and chain that dimension with every subsequent edge. Okay, so jump, jump, jump. You can even right-click on these dimensions. Um, let me get out of this tool. We'll right-click on one of those chain dimensions. We can do an overall dimension, so that overall is going to give us that in, uh, complete value. And then, of course, if you go ahead and start deleting any of these values, things are going to resequence and reorder. But chain, like a fillet and chamfer, um, chain to a base dimension, these are actually bilateral as well. So we can switch them from one behavior to the other with a little right-click. So pretty cool. Uh, again, one of them was added in SOLIDWORKS 2013, a long time ago, and the other one was just this new release, so chain dimension. Okay, notes. Notes are powerful, but for my money, they have to be associative. So I want to do a couple of things here. First, I want to show you how to, to really make them detailed and, and good looking, but also to go ahead and add other things like dimensional values and balloons and table values that actually update. So using any note that we have anywhere, let's just go ahead and double click this one down here. If you double click a note, you can take any section of data just by selecting it. And you can add different things to it, like balloons. So if we come over here to our Properties Manager, we can actually, in this case, um, let's go ahead and put in a, uh, we'll just say inspection, I think is what I want there. Yeah, that'll look good. It'll put a little um, slot around that feature. 
You could also go ahead and take any value like this A right here. And if you wanted that one just to be in a balloon itself, you could also go ahead and add a circular value around that. But with any node or any balloon active, you also have the opportunity to just pick on dimensions around the screen. So by picking them, it will inject them directly into um, this node. Could be you know, a big hole call out in this particular case. Um, could even be a balloon number as it, as it stands. Um, you can also go ahead and grab values from these templates as well. So we can right click and insert a template field. But that value is going to change if this number changes. So I don't mind notes that are detailed, but uh, when they're hard coded, they're manual, they can be error prone. So I'm definitely more of a fan of injecting the dimensions through a selection. So another one of those things that I rarely find people are aware of is dimensions can be set so that it will show you the change dimensions when you move from one document to another. Um, there's a little bit of setup on this one. So let me just go ahead and close what I got open here. And I just want to show you where we're going. The order of operations is critical here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open up an assembly. And uh, the drawing for this assembly is currently not open. That's really how this particular behavior works. When you're working on an assembly or a part and you want to go ahead and make changes to it, and then you open the drawing from this file is when you're going to see this behavior. Under tools and options, there's a color setting. And the color setting is a system options under colors. And it says use specified color for changed drawing dimensions on open. Now, if you go up into your color settings, you can go to dimensions, drawing, and change. You're going to see orange is the color we're going to have. So I just want to give you a preview of the indication. From the assembly or part, if we double click and change a dimension, here we'll go ahead and change this just down to 75. What we've got now is a change. Now we go ahead and right click and open up the drawing from this or say file open and open the drawing for this assembly. What you'll focus on is the lower center view here. What I want you to see under my cursor right in this area is that initially the preview of the drawing is going to open up with regular dimensions, but then once it rebuilds, you'll see those dimensions actually change color. So that's an indicator of what those dimensions were. And even more so if you hover over them, it actually indicates exactly what those values were prior to this particular change. So these happen to be reference dimensions. Those aren't even actual feature or sketch dimensions. So they're different dimensions altogether. It's just a value that updated as a result of a geometric change to this drawing view. So great little feedback there. You go into a pretty detailed drawing and you're going to see exactly where those changes happen to have taken place. All right, drawing views. There's a lot to go on here. And I know we're coming up on 30 minutes here. We're definitely going to go over that for about 15 minutes or so, but well worth it. So two things that I love to do. Um, I like rotating views on a drawing, and I also like to use this thing called a 3D drawing view. There's some stipulations to how each of these work as well. So let me go ahead and again, set this up in a way um, that's going to show you as many things as I can here in a short period. I'm going to go back to an old file here. It's a big standby for me. It works for a lot of situations. So we're just going to go ahead and grab our Desteco clamp. Now the way that the drawing is built has a little bit to do with what's available here. So what I want to do is just show you from scratch making a drawing from this part or assembly. So with this, we'll just drop it on a C-sized piece of paper. No muss, no fuss. And I love using the view palette still to this day. I'm a seasoned user, but it still tees you up with a great way to drop views. And then as you move your cursor off of that, it's going to give you all these other views. Okay, these are projected views. That makes a difference. What I have here now are views that are projected from a parent. So if you move this view, you change this view style, the defaults for all of these is that all of the children views are going to go ahead and mimic what the parent does. Well, there's a button up here at the top. In fact, two of them. One's called rotate view and the other is called 3D drawing view. And if you don't have these, make sure you right click on your tools, go to customize and find them in your commands. All you have to do is find the command wherever it is, might be down here in view. And then you go ahead and grab that button and just drag it up to your toolbar. And there it would be. So get your rotate view, get your 3D drawing view, put them on your toolbar. What this allows us to do is change the orientation of this view. So if I change this view, for example, the front view, which is the main view, what you're going to see is that as I rotate it, all of the pertinent views are going to rotate around the sheet as well. And they have to because they're projections. That's the way a 2D drawing is based. But it allows us to go ahead and make a change to where maybe you have imported data that came in in a different orientation. And that happens often, especially when it comes from a, a completely different kernel or software. But that allows us to go ahead and maybe manipulate what front view is and instead turn that into a side view. What happens here, though, is um, you have some inability to do some of these things all based on how these views are projected. And that comes into the 3D drawing view. 3D drawing view is a pretty cool thing for me. Um, what it enables you to do is pick a view, maybe this one here, doesn't look quite like we want. And it would enable you to actually on the drawing here, go ahead and rotate that a little bit off of where it actually is. Now, one of the problems in this one is that you'll see that I can only cancel this. I can't accept it. And that's because it's a projection from one of the originals. If instead 
I went over here and I simply went to view layout, brought in a model view, and for this assembly, I picked that view, which is going to be the isometric view. What I'm still going to get is the exact same orientation. The difference is, is now I have a view that if I hit 3D drawing view, I can actually rotate slightly, maybe tweak it a little bit, maybe throw it over here, and then say OK, and it will actually stay that way. Not only that, but while you're rotating that, you can also save name views out of what you have. So if I want to save this view as one that's important, then I can go ahead and see that view back in the part file or the assembly file as well. So that's the stipulation there when it comes to 3D drawing views. Now there's one other thing that we can do though. This is really fantastic and it has to do with section views. So let me just quickly snap a section through the center of this top view. Do that real fast and we'll throw that in place. You may have accidentally located something that allows us to do a similar feature here with this isometric view, excuse me, the section view. See, I just Freudian slipped there. You can right click inside this view and there's an option called isometric section view. It's a very quick way to be able to draw a plan view type of a section, but get a really nifty look at what it's going to look like in this orientation. Um, the cap color there is actually based on the sections uh, hatching that we have, and you can change that view to a different hatching. That color kind of makes it look purple. However, it's not necessary for this type of view. When you have this particular view, you can actually, with a section view, use the same type of 3D drawing view. And I can roll it to a position that maybe makes a little bit more sense, whatever that happens to be. And when I say OK to it, it's going to go ahead and lock that view into place. Any one of these views could be shown in an exploded state, and it gives you some flexibility to maybe reposition those to maybe get the explode looking a little bit better when those parts maybe are overlapping each other. So 3D drawing views have to be named views, or in this case, the section view. Um, in this case, a named view, not a projected view, allows us to rotate. So those are the little stipulations that allow us to use those two types of tools. Now, model color and views. I see a lot of ways to try and pull this off. And I'm going to show you four of them that I've come up with. Um, when you want to look at a drawing, of course, you can show the display state that you would inside of a part or assembly. And that's going to be shaded with edges or without, and then wireframe shaded or hidden lines removed. So what we get in this case here is some opportunity to actually show full on color. There's a few different ways that I want to depict this for you. So let's go back into SOLIDWORKS again for a second. And I want to pull up one of those original drawings that I had uh, just a couple minutes ago. There's some interesting ways to add color to parts. And the first one is a very simple way. It's just simply turning on the color settings that happen to be there. But it's an on or off situation. So once we have this file open, let me just go back to my Desteco clamp and I will show you this one right away. So what we have is a drawing. And if you go to Tools and Options, this is a document setting. So we'd actually go physically to the document properties, very important there. And then we're going to go to the document properties here, simply called detailing. And right down here, we have this one called use model color and hidden lines removed, hidden lines visible drawings, and then even with speed pack. But just by saying use model color, what it will do is take the drawing from just this monochrome to the actual color that each of those files are. So we are still in wireframe, but we're showing each and every color as depicted by the parts color itself. So pretty awesome feature there. Now, if we want to do this a little bit more piecemeal, I don't want to make my entire assembly mostly gray so I can have one blue part highlighted. So there's other ways of doing this a little bit more individually. Now, two ways that I want to show you this um, are going to be one, well, it's really an old school method. I use layers to get it done. So we're going back to a different view here with these exploded components. Another one is something called component line font. So we're going to make a lot of these parts here look a little different. First one here, if I right click on a component, you go down to Component Line Font. Now, usually you can find that on the right-click menu here. It's right up here on the top. And what it will do is give you a quick opportunity to change the types of edges to anything you'd like them to be. So instead of solid, we can go ahead and make these dashed or dotted. Thickness can be changed. And now you've got a part that's completely different than the rest of the parts graphically visible. What you can also do is change the layer of a particular part. Now, in this drawing here, and, and in SOLIDWORKS in general, I don't really have a lot of use for layers. But if I have a deliverable that's based on layers, or if I have this particular need to use it to pull this little technique off, this is the kind of thing that I would do. Right now, these parts are sitting on the dimensions layer. It happens to be black at this time. But if you pick a different layer and say move, that will actually change the color of the part as well. And you can get a twofer on that. You can actually pick the part and go down and change its component line font and have different color as well as different visible edges in the way that this part gets used. So pretty interesting in those methods right there. Last way is display states. Now each one of these views you could show in a 2D drawing as a display state. The display state is generally based on its shaded view. And if we look at this one shaded, again you can see all the individual colors that happen to be there. 
Now, this is a shaded view, but if we go into the display state of this particular file, so let's take our assembly and let's open that up real quick here. What we'll actually see is that if I want to go ahead and add a display state or change the color of this or, or even go ahead and uh, you know, make a part transparent, for example, what that would inevitably give me here is something that's going to be a display state. So if we're back in the actual drawing file, what that file looking like in the 3D part or assembly is what that file is going to look like here in the 2D drawing. So this is just changing the display state that was active, but in a part or an assembly, you can right click and add multiple display states and even go ahead and switch between those depending on um, what we might be trying to do here. So we only have one display state on this one, so that's the way that's going to show. So that's four different methods of trying to get parts showing as different colors in model view displays. This one here is a pretty quick one. We'll just do this one fast. Custom detail view shapes. Um, that's way back in 2001 plus. Been doing that forever. And then one that we added three, uh, four releases ago now is mirroring views. Mirroring is something that we try to do a lot in different part and assembly functionalities. Really, I think the easiest way is to just do it right here at the drawing. So let's do both of those. I find it interesting that a lot of customers are um, still somewhat unaware of some of the basic features here. Um, when we do things like detail views, detail view is real simple because it drops you into a circle tool and it lets you just make a quick detail view and that's great. But did you know that you can actually pre-sketch something and use that for your detail view? It doesn't matter what the shape is, it just has to be a sketch entity that's bounding an area. So we'll go to full smash here and use a spline tool for this one. Just by drawing a spline ahead of time, bounding an area the way that you might want to, and this is going to be a little elaborate. What we do is we take that sketch and have it selected, and then we select our uh, uh, detail view tool. What it will do is it will utilize that shape in order to go ahead and create this exact detail view. So just for the sake of clarity, let me move that off of there a little bit. Now I want to show you this a little bit more. Let's go ahead and just say connected. That's going to make them look visible. And you can see that this outside thing has a body or a shape to it. So for clarity, let me just go ahead and make that shaded. So again, it's very easy to see. And there's other settings that allow you to say maybe no outline or maybe a full outline, but that full outline might be, you know, having some other little jagged things on there. The jagged doesn't work in shaded. If you're in wireframe or hidden lines, then you can actually turn on jagged and where those parts break, it's actually going to show with either a high or a low intensity jag here. That looks a lot better than it did when it was first released. So those are great. But those are different ways to make these custom shapes. Now it shows over here as a circle, but if you right click on that and you have to edit that sketch, that's going to go ahead and actually um, bring that spline tool back up for you. So custom shapes, they're pretty easy to do. When it comes to mirroring, these parts here are pretty much axis symmetric, so they don't really make sense. So I want to pull up a file from a few years ago where we were making prosthetics um, for, for arms, which is the quintessential left hand, right hand situation. So when you're looking at files like this, this is a fully detailed drawing and if we needed to make the opposite hand, what we don't want to have to do is spend the time making a completely um, duplicate drawing, it just happens to be the opposite. So again, I've mentioned a lot of different methods where we try to mirror parts and assemblies and maybe bring dimensions over or not or keep the association. There's just a lot of different dances that we would do there. The easiest possible way to make left hand and right hand is very simple. Pick the view, simply hit mirror, and then choose whether you want it mirrored vertical or horizontal left hand or right hand. All the annotations go with it, and all you have now is a 2D drawing in the exact opposite direction, but based on the original files. So theoretically with this one here, you could go ahead and take this drawing, save it as a copy called mirror, and then just simply trigger this mirror on that drawing. And now you've got two associative duplicate models without having to reinvent anything. So mirror view is a real powerful tool to get that done. If you don't need a model to track, then you can go ahead and just take care of it here at the production level. Really great stuff. Okay, markup. Markup was added in SOLIDWORKS 2019, but it didn't really become available to the user um, with a mouse or um, in drawings here until SOLIDWORKS 2020. So that's really why I wanted to bring that up. To make you aware of it, if you're on a drawing and you need to make a markup, what's going to happen is a folder will get created over here in the property manager. Simply click markup, can't have a view selected, but go ahead and grab your markup tool, choose your ink of choice, and then even the thickness of that. And all you have to do is draw directly on the screen exactly where you want that markup to be. So each one of these is an individual markup. It'll create a feature, it'll create a feature in the folder, and if you hover over that, you'll actually see a thumbnail of what that looks like. Everything is depicted specifically about, about what you see when you create the markup. So if we change the color and we zoom in a little bit, of course it's going to go ahead and have everything to do with exactly what it looks like right now. So if I go ahead and add that, it's going to add that markup, and again my thumbnail is going to look that way. Right clicks allow you to actually export those as image files, or you can go ahead and edit the markup if you need to. 
Orient is there because of 3D parts and assemblies, which this type of markup is also supported in in SOLIDWORKS 2019 and 2020. So great little tool there. You might not be aware of it because it's fairly new. But up until SOLIDWORKS 2019, it was only available using touchscreen computers or Wacom tablets. So mouse support is what we've got there. So some interesting drawing options. If you go to Tools and Options, you can turn on uppercase for all these three types, the notes, the tables, and any type of dimensions. It is retroactive. If you pick a dimension on the actual drawing, you can pick it out of the Property Manager. And if you have tables or notes that are previously created or in your design library, you can also trigger those retroactively. By going to Tools and Options and setting it for your templates, you're going to make them uppercase from this point on so that you don't have to worry about that. Custom drawing scales were made available in SOLIDWORKS 2020 as well. Really what this comes down to is that when your drawing is of a particular standard, you're going to have a list down here that's customized. Now right now this drawing happens to be a millimeters gram second, so it's metric. But if I switch this over to a different type of standard, in this particular case what I want to do is go to this file and we want to make it an ANSI file. What we're now going to get is the list based on the text file that I have edited. So if I look at this now, what you're going to see is now 177 to 1, a 1 to 5,000, a 1 to 7,500. Those definitely do not exist by default. Those are ones that I've actually added. And they were added based on the SOLIDWORKS install directory file, much like the whole callout TXT file. Um, I'm going to browse to this one manually just so you can see this. And I know we're going a little bit long today, but we're going to keep going here anyway. If you go ahead to your default location, the C drive, program files, Go into your SOLIDWORKS specific. It could be SOLIDWORKS Corp. I changed the year because I have multiple versions. But underneath that folder, you're going to go into SOLIDWORKS. This is localized for the language, so that's why we go to the language folder often. And then English is the only language that I installed. So we have a file down here that if you just hit the D button, it will get you down there. It's called drawingscales.txt. Now if I take a look at that, what you're going to notice is there's my additions. I've got the 75 to 1, and those are all added based on that standard. They didn't show because on ISO or any modifieds, they're not going to be there. Now, I have two recommendations if you're going to go ahead and uh, change this file. First of all, don't overwrite it here, because when you update your service pack, SOLIDWORKS is going to re-overwrite it. Um, you also can't save here. You have to save it to the desktop and copy it back in here. But just like anything else, if you go to Tools and Options, go to File Locations, you can put this in a network location so everybody else can look at it. So under File Locations, if we simply go down to, this is going to be your whole callout. I'm sorry, this is going to be the uh, um, Drawing Scale. So if you look under Drawing Scale Standards, it's going to simply, simply show you where that points. Put it in a network folder and point to it there, and it won't get overwritten when your service packs get updated. But it does give you the ability to grab this list and make it exactly what you need it to be. Get rid of some of these other here that you might not use. Add ones that you use constantly. Really, really good productivity function. All right, detailing mode. Last couple of things I want to talk about. Detailing mode was added in SOLIDWORKS 2020, and it allows you to open up really large assembly drawings very, very quickly. Um, with assemblies like these, uh, really what you end up getting is a really long load time, and nine times out of ten, we want to do things like saving PDFs or DWG files or just basic annotations. So those are the kind of things that when you're using SOLIDWORKS, um, opening up the entire drawing isn't necessarily, or, or the entire assembly and resident memory isn't necessarily important. Now, if I go ahead and open up this drawing here, what I want to do is expand this out and use the new detailing mode open. When I actually open this file, this is a 5500 part assembly. And if I was to send this drawing to somebody else, they actually wouldn't even need the parts or assemblies. And it's different than the detached drawing mode that you might be used to, um, or if you've tried. But essentially with this file here, what I get in about 10 seconds is all 5500 parts, all of the different sheets loaded, and the ability to manipulate and add annotations to things. Now there's a list of things that you do have to have it fully resolved for, like creating section views and adding bill of materials. But other than that, as we work, the line art is here. So if I want to come into any of these views and I want to start adding dimensions as necessary, all that type of stuff, of course, is 100% supported. So we're adding different things to, uh, to the drawing just based on what we're clicking. The important part here is that you can do everything that you do in typical drawings for annotation purposes, except for adding new views and, and adding those things. So you've got to revise it and fully resolve it once, and then you're going to get those types of behaviors. But at this point, again, the most um, that a lot of users do with big files is they open them up just so that they can export those. And I can export it or save it without actually resolving. And that's going to take me right to the low-hanging fruit, which is typically things like DWGs and DXFs, uh, or PNG files, or PDFs. So opening up a drawing real quickly, be able to go ahead and generate a PDF. Again, very important to be able to knock that out fast. Opening up a 5500 part drawing resolved. 
it takes a few minutes and it just is what it is, especially if you're working across the network. What it did here is it quickly went ahead and generated this file. And if you take a look at all the different views, you can even see the little flub I did there on my revision cloud. So it quickly makes it, the line art is there. So the drawing views are stunningly crisp. Um, and it's a very, very good productivity tool for opening large assembly drawings very quickly. So keep that in mind. It's file open and it is opening them up in detail mode. All right, last thing here, we'll give you a quick bonus. Alternate position view, one of my all time favorite features ever. It allows you to depict movement of parts and assemblies on a 2D drawing. And I said parts this time, and I'm not kidding on that one. What it really is, is it's overlaying a configuration on top of an existing view. Now it's always worked for assemblies because movement is a big deal with our dynamic assembly motion, but now we can do it with parts so that we can show the cast and the machine parts overlaid with each other. So let me show you that real quickly and then we'll go ahead and wrap this particular uh, presentation up. So one more time, let me just make a really quick drawing here because I want everybody to see this. We use our Desteco clamp and uh, our Desteco clamp is just a real simple um, you know, part for, for showing how movement takes place. I think everybody's aware of exactly the functionality of a clamp like this. So when we go ahead and have a drawing that's made of these different views. What we're gonna do is just do a quick overlay. And for years, people would try to do this putting in uh, say two views and aligning the origins and then you got one view on top of each other and then you can't do anything to edit the view. So this is where this works. You pick your view and under your view layout tab, you're gonna have alternate position view. And if you don't, Go up to your command search and type in alternate position view and then go ahead and just drag that over to your toolbars okay just like that when you pick it what it will do is either say do you want to choose an existing configuration if you've already made one or do you want to make a new one we're going to make a new one here it'll then open up this assembly in the orientation of the view that you've selected so what we get now is the front view and all dynamic assembly motion functionality turns on so collision detection and everything else is going to be right there so I hit my options turn on collision and then as soon as i hit there we are at the bottom once I say OK, what it will do is then create the overlay by changing all the parts that have moved to phantom representation. Now you can even change this view to a shaded view if you want. It's going to have a nice little overlay there. Let me do a quick little control Q to kind of clean that up a touch. Um, but what that gives us is the full overlay of one view to the next. And it's not dumb geometry, by the way. Um, I want to be very clear with that, although my graphics aren't really happy with what we've got going on right now. So let's see what I can do with that. But it's not dumb geometry to the respect where if I go ahead and take a look at these views side by side and I move this view, you'll see that over in the drawing, that view updates. So the overlay that we're getting there is actually showing the update. I'm not quite sure why it's shaded right now, but my video, there we go, a little refresh. Um, so what you're seeing here basically is that update. Now over in the 2D drawing, we can use our dimensions, so whether we're using annotations or whatever. Over there, we can actually go ahead and start adding dimensions to that. So if we're on our 2D drawing and we grab our dimensional tools, um, it is reference dimensions, but they are associative. So you can pick on the edges of this part and you can put those dimensions in wherever it makes sense. And then with those dimensions, as you start to change things, again, associativity is king. So when I start to move things around, the 14 degrees now becomes four degrees and so on and so forth. So it's a fantastic way to show um, movement in parts. Now that said, oh, sorry, movement in assemblies. That said, there's another Freudian slip. I wanted to show you really quickly um, movement in parts. And the reason this is important is because um, we need to be able to overlay configurations of things. And that's really the, the main thing that we're trying to get to um, with this particular file. So we're showing that movement, but we're showing change, which is going to be a part that's maybe a, a machined version versus its cast representation on top of that as well. Excuse me one second. Let me open that one more time. We'll get that guy resolved. Okay. So once we have this file open, we're really doing the exact same thing. We're just choosing an existing configuration of a particular part file. So with this pump housing over here, we have its machined iteration. And iteration is king. Um, iterating is an important thing because the, the ability to change quickly is really how you keep up. You don't have to make things perfect. You just have to change them quick. By picking this view, you'll notice that the view layout tool has alternate position view available, which it would not have done before. Now we can change this to the other configuration, which is casting, and it'll give us that perfect overlay right on top of it. Now again, if I go ahead and start switching this up with my shaded view, we're going to see the difference between the cast and the machine version, and those edges are usable. So I can easily come in here and start grabbing on edges and simply putting in associative dimensions to each of those. So it's an important thing to be able to do because, of course, um, we're trying to show change, and that change has to be dimensioned here on the 2D drawing. So important stuff. Those are associative, configurations and dimensions change, and everything will update. All right, so 
We've gotten a taste of what it's like to hear me talk at a very fast rate. And I do appreciate you hanging around a little bit extra here. I know we said 30 minutes, but went about 45 or so. Um, we covered a lot of different things. Again, tips and tricks is interesting because you can go to 10 different tips and tricks presentations, frankly, by the same person, and you're going to see 10 completely different presentations. If you have requests, I definitely welcome those kind of things, uh, whether it's a full floor for a full presentation, uh, for a video, or for just a webinar like this kind of a thing here. So if you're looking for something interesting, let us know. And we'll get back to you and we'll uh, maybe use that as inspiration for an actual meeting. So we covered a lot with bill materials and ballooning. Um, dimensions and detailing is a really open-ended subject, but putting them on there in the quickest way possible using things like the dimension palette, um, the rapid dimension, as well as you know being able to edit things quickly and, and add different um, formats from one to the other with the format painter. A lot of ways to manipulate drawing views and the new markup functionality for communication is there. And then detailing mode. This one's your, one you're going to want to look at if you're using assemblies that are even a reasonable size. Um, you can send those out to detailers. They don't have to have the files. They will simply re-handshake with the file once you open it fully resolved. Really cool stuff. So thank you once again. Please follow us on some of our social media sites. Uh, we're going to be posting this video up on YouTube here within the, uh, the next couple of days. So we'll get that out there. But you'll be notified of presentations like this as well as content that's going up constantly by all of our AEs around the world. So um, follow us on uh, YouTube. Go Engineer is our site. I am on Twitter individually as uh, at Go with Darren. And then you can also just follow us completely through those social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. So again, I really appreciate your time. I hope it was worth it. Um, come, back, come back again and, and see us in our next presentation. Uh, let us know if there's anything that you'd like to see. So wherever you happen to be, have a great day. And we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you for attending.